Sutra opening who are visiting from Ocean Gate Zen Center down in Santa Cruz. They surfed up. And, um, so they're just staying here for a couple of days and uh, very nice to have you. Um, so afterwards, please ask them if what I say is um, true or not. <laughs> so this is the third class in a series of nine uh, on a text by a monk named Menzon who lived in the 18th century. Um, uh, entitled Jiju Zongmai, in which um, he is endeavoring to set out an understanding of the way of practice that was uh, recommended or promoted by Dogen Zenji, the founder of the Soto school of, uh, of Zen Buddhism uh, in Japan. And uh, as I mentioned before, he was a kind of reformer, or we can even say revital revitalizer, revivalist, is that what it is? A revivalist, and uh, he and there was uh, several other um, kind of prominent uh, teachers at that time who were uh, interested in promoting the Soto school and uh, trying to get down to the root of what uh, Dogen was um, trying to teach. In fact, they're the ones who gathered together many of the texts of Dogen Zenji and started to really define the Soto school as a Dogen school. Dogen, of course, was the lineage holder who brought the, that lineage from China to Japan, but in many ways up until the period of Menzong, he was one ancestor in the line of many, many ancestors and was not focused on quite in the way that he is today in, this, in the Soto school. And so they're collecting his um, works, promoting them, reading them, trying to understand them more thoroughly and, and putting them really um, at the center. So um, as I said in the first class, one of the reasons I chose this text is because uh, I think to understand the kind of practice that uh, uh, is uh, being presented here at Buddha Eye Temple, we can go to Menzon for that kind of um, uh, clarification. And uh, it's also uh, helpful to understand, you know, kind of what, what is the approach um, of, this, um, of this particular school and what is not the approach of this particular school. Um, uh, some of that clarification can be um, helpful. But more importantly, it's about your practice. What are you doing? What are you encountering in your life? I don't even like the word practice all that much. It's just like life. What is life? and uh, engage with the Buddha Dharma, um, uh, what, is, what is really most important. And, and I have found that these uh, teachings, this, this uh, style of practice is um, a very, very clarifying about what it means to um, uh, live a human life. So um, in these nine classes, I'll talk a little bit of, uh, more about this tonight. Last time I forgot to give you kind of what's the next chunk that we're going to be um, looking at within the text. And um, I'll try to do that uh, each, um, each uh, time. Um, I realize some people don't have the text tonight. We ran out of copies, and so we'll be making some more. There, it's also online on our website. You can click on it and, and 
um, and uh, look at the text there. And then if you come next week, there'll be many more copies. So um, you can have a, a paper uh, a copy then. Uh, I'll refer to the text um, in the lecture to some degree, but I'll also I will always quote the parts that I'm talking about fully. And then also, well, there's not enough time, nor is it necessarily the best thing, to be going through the text kind of line by line. And so my aim in this kind of lectures is not to um, give a detailed commentary on every line of the text. It would take you know a couple years of classes, or I don't know, many years of classes to be able to do that. Um, really, my goal is to help you develop a relationship with the text. That's what these kind of lecture series are about. And other times we're not really used to thinking about texts in that term, like that we'll have a relationship with them. But um, that's something that uh, I think is really important and I try to promote is um, that as you develop a relationship with a text, it becomes something that's alive in your life and in your facing of, um, of the great matter. And so um, as you develop relationship with different texts, some of them will become more prominent for you. Some of them will be things that you go back to again and again and again. And others, the relationship will be, you know, maybe hopefully longer than a one night stand, you know, maybe a nine week stand <laughs> um, uh, while we're talking about it here. But that's a way that, um, that uh, everyone, you know, um, uh, develops in the way. For me, this particular text, we studied it almost right when Buddha Eye opened um, 20 years ago. And um, I think it was just about 20 years ago. And uh, it was, was one of the early things that I lectured on when, when we started here. And I find myself going back to this text again and again and again and again. So for me, this has been a really helpful um, a text, continues to really live uh, in my life. So that's why I wanted um, to talk about it. Um, so anyway, as we're going along, hopefully that relationship starts to build. And then in your own reading, I'd encourage you that if you're coming to these um, lectures to reread the part that we're talking about after the lecture, um, read the next part that I'm recommending, go back to the beginning and read it up to the point that we are. It's not that long and you will certainly miss almost everything you read each time you read. That's the quality of reading. Um, and so when you go back through it again and again and again and again, things start to form up in a way that um, don't when you just read it once. Furthermore, I'm always really recommending try not to read with an overly extractive mind. Like if you read it where you're trying to pull the meaning out all the time, especially of things that you don't really get, you tend to do a lot of um, awkward forcing of meaning or significance, which really isn't necessary. The text isn't going anywhere. So just let it teach you what it's teaching you while you're there. It doesn't mean you might not really like wrestle with something. That's good to wrestle with it. But that extractive mind where we're like really doing a lot of phil philosophical backbending to try to pull something out of it um, usually just gives us some kind, is a reflection of our twisted karma in one way or another and um, isn't uh, usually so helpful. So repetition, um, ease, developing relationship, and then the questions that come out of a text that challenges us in some way. That's um, that's why I think also this kind of a little bit intellectual study is is helpful. And almost always with these, people say, why this is so complicated? Why do we talk about this? And couldn't we just practice? Yes, we do this for one hour a week. <laughs> we sit for, you know, 30 hours a week. So if you don't want to, sweet. Come to Zazen. <laughs> but the point of this is to do some of that wrestling because there's a value in that. But it's not the main thing that we do. Um, but the, but these kind of teachings, philosophical type teachings, they help us to rearrange the way we're thinking about something. And that way I think they're, you know, they're really valuable, but only if they're in the context of a larger, of a larger thing. Um, one other thing before we kind of launch in today, I thought you might, it might be interesting for you to see what the text looks like in Japanese. Um, and especially because this book is a kind of very special book, there's a publisher in Kyoto, um, it so happens that when Manzan was writing, he's a prolific writer, um, was the same time that the printing technology in Japan was kind of taking a turn. And uh, what they figured out was rather than setting type, I don't know if you know this, but like Gutenberg Bible was like way behind on printing. In, in, in East Asia, they had printing way before that. The earliest printed book in the world is the Diamond Sutra. 
Um, that's proof that there's someone looking out for us. Um, <laughs> and so uh, the, that movable type was, the, was the, the typical way that that happened. And so if you think about Chinese characters are really difficult to, you know, to be uh, creating, carving something to be able to print it. So in that style of printing, they would have these massive storehouses of all these um, of all these characters, and then they would, you know, line them up like we do in the movable type in um, Western printing. But at the, around the time of Menzon, there was a change in that approach. What they figured out, and I think this is kind of like very, just so Japanese, that they could develop artisans that were so good at carving that they could carve it quicker than they could assemble the, the movable type. And so the cool thing about that is we have block prints that are a couple hundred years old that are still, they can still be used because it wasn't movable type. They have these massive pieces of wood with these carvings in it. And so a text like this, you can go to the shop, it's been there for a few hundred years. I mean, it's been rebuilt a few times, but the one you go into now is pretty old. And, uh, and you slide in there and you can get a book um, like this that is printed from those, uh, those very old texts. So I'll pass this around if you like to, if you like to look at it. It's got a kind of a nice quality. And if you're into that kind of thing, um, you can notice how it's very, you can notice the carving, like it's different than a calligraphy style um, Chinese or Japanese or something like that. You can tell somebody was, um, was carving it. So that's, this is the text in, I couldn't find the text in a simpler kind of form. I was looking for it online to print for people who read Japanese, but um, this was kind of as, um, as good as it got. If you're ever in Kyoto, or if you're ever planning to go to Kyoto, let's let me know. I'll tell you where it is, and you can go have a good time. Okay, any housekeeping stuff? Is that all more or less good? You know what I forgot? I forgot to bring my watch, which means we could be here till midnight or something, mm -hmm. left to my own devices. Um, so if you put that down. So, like I mentioned, uh, the, the aim here of Menzon is to try to clarify what is the practice that we're, um, uh, that we're doing, the practice of Zazen in particular. And um, he's very strong on this point that what we think of as Zazen uh, is usually we're thinking of meditation practice, that we're practicing a kind of um, uh, yogic, psychological, um, spiritual exercise uh, called meditation, which is going to help us release delusion and uncover our true uh, nature. And Dogen says that's not what Zazen is. He says that's a misunderstanding. People called us the Zen school because they saw Bodhidharma, the famous monk who came from South Asia, traveled to China after a kind of um, inspiring slash discouraging uh, interaction with the emperor, takes his seat on Shaolin Mountain and faces the wall and sits there for nine years. And they saw him and they said, oh, he's doing meditation. His followers are the Zen school. And, um, and so uh, 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 Menzon says that that's a misunderstanding. If we think by Zazen, what we mean is a kind of yogic exercise. He says that Zazen is the mind of awakening. Particularly, he references the, um, the first story of transmission, where Shakyamuni Buddha, um, all, the, all of his followers assembled. Um, he's supposed to give a sermon, like he would do on a daily basis, and on that particular day, he picked up a flower and slightly twirled it in his hand and didn't say anything. And it said that Mahakashapa, one of his closest students, smiled. And he said, Mahakashapa, I entrust to you the wondrous mind of nirvana, the treasury of the true dharma I. And that story is the story of the first uh, transmission of the dharma. He says, this is what we're practicing. It's this wondrous mind of nirvana, this, this uh, storehouse of the true dharma I. It's the samadhi of innumerable meanings from the Lotus Sutra. It's the Samadhi of the King of Samadhis, of the Prajnaparamita Sutras. And in the text, you'll read that he has this long list of all the things that it is. And um, he says, that's what we should trust in, uh, in our um, practice. And he says that this is like encountering the Udumbara flower, 
which is an image um, from um, Asian religious tradition. It shows up in different places, but usually in Buddhism, it refers to this flower, which blooms only once in 3,000 years. And so he says, this is like seeing the flower that's impossible to see. I was reading a little bit about this earlier today, and it's, a, it's related to a fig tree, like we have here. And you notice there's these wonderful fruits on fig trees, but you never see the flower because the flower is inside the fruit. It, what makes the fruit happen is this kind of inversion of the flower. Um, anyway, talk with Jacqueline if you want to know more about that. It's quite poetic and, um, uh, and uh, has a deep understanding of that. But I love that image too. It's like this flower that is so intimate, you never see it. It's not of the nature of being seen. And yet it is the central uh, fruit uh, of the tradition. By the way, the fig tree is uh, deeply related to the Bodhi tree. Um, Bodhi tree is, I think the Latin name is something like religioso figus or something like that. <laughs> um, I mean, that, that religious fig. Um, so, um, so this is what he refers to, that when we're practicing Zazen, we're encountering something that can't be encountered. It's so subtle that um, we have this uh, great opportunity that's been entrusted to us uh, through this transmission. And um, he takes a very strong swing at a style of practice that is based on self and other. If you remember at the beginning of the text, which um, I encourage you to go back and read that introduction again and again. It's a little esoteric, where he talks about the, the origins of the term Gigi on my as being um, the reference to Verachana Buddha's illumination, that there's two ways to understand the illumination or two um, facets of the illumination. One is the self-receiving and employing samadhi of Verachana Buddha, the self that receives the light of the self and illuminates the self that has no other. The other aspect is the other receiving and illuminating um, aspect of Verachana Buddha, which is the whole universe, that light showing up as every thing of the universe. And the Buddha's wisdom is in total response to the suffering of all of those beings. Okay. So um, Menzan introduces that right at the beginning, saying that the opposition of self and other that we normally think about is not, um, is not ultimately true, but it's not going to do to try to squish self and other together. And then he takes this sw a very strong swing. Is he even surprised about the strength of his language when you read it? Does it make you uncomfortable at all when he's like, those stupid jerks who <laughs> don't understand, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's a, um, that's, that's common, actually. Uh, in um, in text and Dogen's famous for that kind of um, talk too. I would say all of the um, various um, uh, people with strong faith in their way um, <laughs> tend to use that kind of um, language. Um, I think it's a little bit, uh, at least in kind of modern day liberal type society, we've eschewed that type of talking. So um, um, anyway, suck it up. <laughs> um, so he takes this very strong swing at this kind of practice that's based in the dichotomy of self and other. And the way that I was talking about this um, last time was we can think about self and other as being about myself as an individual and then other people. But I think there's another way that's um, even more important. And that is when we think of ourself as, I'm going to put a D on our head because we're deluded. And so that's the self. And then the other. Um, is he's got a top knot, that's a hint. Okay. And he's always sitting. Oh well, gosh, that's a very strange looking Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just call that Buddha. Okay. So we think of we think of the deluded as the self and the Buddha as the other, and that in between here there is Zen. Transformative Zen practice. And that what our job is, is to use this transformative Zen practice to strip off the delusion and find the true nature of our Buddhahood and transform into a Buddha. This is very standard Buddhist teaching. In a way, there's just nothing wrong with this. But Menzan lays into this saying that this is kind of a devil speak, 
right? That this is a misunderstanding of um, what practice is about. That the leveraging that happens here when we think about Zen as a method um, is uh, alienating us from the true illumination of the Buddha's awakening, which is something that is um, presented to all of us. And this, it's very enticing to think about becoming a different being, becoming an other, especially if you're not so jazzed about the current state of yourself, that that can be a really, that's very natural. And I think all of us come to practice with that, at least to some degree. We think I'll practice in this way and then I'll become this other thing. Many times we don't have the courage to really think of Buddhahood as the other side of this, but just fill in the blank for whatever it is that um, you're sort of hoping practice will do. Um, and I find this teaching very strict. Um, I also find it helpful. I also find sometimes it can be too like discouraging. I actually don't think there's any problem with coming to practice with a little hope that you might change your lot. <laughs> That's important, you know, that kind of inspiration. But the question is, how do we do that? Do we do it by trying to rid ourselves of our problems? Do we do it by trying to strip off the, um, uh, you know, the unsightly things and leave them behind? Or do we cherish what is there and what those things have to teach us? That's a very kind of different way or attitude about practice, which goes all the way down to what's the attitude that you take when you, when you sit down on the cushion? You know, are you there to get rid of all the extra stuff and, and find this? Or is there something that's more fundamental than that activity of getting away from yourself and becoming something, uh, becoming something different? Um, so you'll notice that he uses a couple terms to, to refer to this style of practice. One of them in this translation is Hinayana, which means a small vehicle. And in the Mahayana, the Hinayana is a good punching bag, right? Because, you know, of course, who called it, the, who named it the Hinayana? Ma. It was a Mahayana, of course, you know. Um, but um, but uh, I, I want to be, uh, two things I want to say that. One is the text doesn't actually say Hinayana. It says the two vehicles. And the two vehicles often it gets translated as the Hinayana because it's easier for people to understand if they know that lingo. The two vehicles... Um, uh, refers to two paths, which are classically called the Shravaka path and the Pracheka Buddha path. And a, and a, um, a Shravaka is, means a hearer. It would have been the followers of Shakyamuni Buddha that heard his teachings, and they follow the path of the Arhat, trying to dry up all of the worldly um, passions. And the other, the Pracheka Buddha, is a Buddha that um, is awakened by themselves, um, through following the 12 link chain of dependent origination. They don't have a teacher, they're, they're alone. That's what Pracheka Buddha means, is kind of an isolated Buddha. And um, traditionally in Mahayana, these two are criticized, but they're also celebrated. Right? They're celebrated as being a face of a bodhisattva. In the Lotus Sutra, you know, the Lotus Sutra says, oh, they're actually bodhisattvas. Maybe even it says, they don't realize it. But they're actually bodhisattvas, and and um, and so I like that about that. We shouldn't be just too critical of that. Although we we should we should clarify something. He also says that this is a teaching in many provisional Mahayana teachings, right? and so he leans in to try to clarify our practice isn't that. It's not this lever. And in that process, he's really critical of koan practice. He's um, critical of no mind, no thought type practice, and he's critical of the searching for the subject um, type of practice. These are all practices that are um, common and at his time uh, were also common. I had mentioned, and this is really important, he doesn't just criticize koan practice in general, he's criticizing a particular type of koan practice. And if anybody ever tells you that Soto Zen doesn't utilize koans, they're wrong. <laughs> Soto Zen is full of koans. Just go read Dogen's writing. He can't write a, a whole page without referencing a koan in there. So koans are part and parcel of a Soto Zen practice. What is not typical in most Soto Zen lineages is taking up certain phrases from a koan and focusing on them for the purposes of, um, of uh, seeing into something. So the, the most common um, version of that practice that people have heard of is uh, if you go to a Rinzai teacher uh, these days or a koan curriculum teacher, almost always the first uh, koan that will, they will give you, people refer to as mu. 
and that's the koan of does dog have Buddha nature? Mu. And mu means no, but it also is just a total negation. And so people will just focus on mu, 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 mu. And that becomes the focus of, uh, of the meditation. So that's a style of koan practice, um, but it can be used with many different koans. You take a piece and you, and you focus on it, and it you know, maybe blows up your mind. Sounds exciting, but Manzan um, is not um, a fan of that, uh, of that approach. Again, because it has this leveraging type quality. No mind and no thought, really giving over to um, a blankness. Um, we might not think of that as a lever, right? Not in the same way of a technique that takes you to enlightenment, but it is a kind of a lever or maybe a hammer that squishes out life. Like how much easier life would be if it just wasn't? Right? Like it's so complicated. And so this disassociation maybe would be a word that we would use uh, today for that. Just being able to unhook and just go blank. Um, that's really easy to fall into in, um, in meditation. If you ever find you're meditating for a long time and then you go about doing things in your day and maybe you're especially around other people and they're uber annoying, check your meditation. <laughs> Yeah, good chance that, that there's, a, there's a healthy dose of just disassociation in there. Now, people are annoying. So <laughs> I'm not saying that you, know, you can't be annoyed by anybody. But if you find that meditation is leading in you kind of into a deeper and deeper annoyance with the complications of life, um, there's a good chance that no thought, no mind is really a, a kind of disassociative um, practice for you in some way. Um, anyway, so he goes through a number of these kinds of practices, but it all boils down to, and this is on the bottom of page um, uh, 9 and then into 10. He says, they aspire to rid themselves of delusion and to gain enlightenment, to eliminate illusory thoughts and to obtain the truth. This is not, but nothing but creating the karma of acceptance and rejection. Such an attitude is just another form of dualism in that one escapes from one thing and chases after another. Very plain language. He's saying when we practice like this, we're just doing the same thing we do everywhere, maybe in a more sophisticated way, maybe in a different realm, you know, maybe it's not like, how do I get rich? But it ain't that much different. It's like, how do I get out of my current situation and get to this place which I've decided is the, is the place that's gonna make me happy, and I chase after it. It has the same instability, um, uh, um, again and again and again. It doesn't lead to really settling down into practice. And so I had presented this different way that we could think about this relationship between the Buddha and a deluded um, being. And that was, um, let's see if I can do a better job with the Buddha. It's the top knot that really throws it. I'm just going to put a B on his head. Maybe that will solve all problems. So you have a Buddha. Rather than thinking of the Buddha as something that you turn into as you get rid of, another way of thinking of the Buddha is that um, even as a being may progress on the path, that the Buddha's uh, awakening is at the basis of that all the way along that our Buddha nature is present even in the most miserable circumstances. And that what we're doing is not trying to boot the self to get to the Buddha, but to rely on the Buddha nature that is uh, a present and not to kick the deluded person off the boat, but that the deluded person transforms through a recognition of their own Buddha. Um, a Dogen Zenji in the um, Eihei Koroku, which is a record of teachings that he gave to his disciples at Eiheiji. I love this line where he says, sometimes I enter Jiji Uzanmai. So sometimes I enter this Samadhi. And that's what we're studying about, is this Jiji Uzanmai, the Samadhi, the Zazen that Dogen's promoting. So he says, sometimes I enter Jiji Uzanmai, simply wishing you all to trust what your hands can hold. So sometimes I enter Jiju Zammai, simply wishing you all to trust what your hands can hold. He doesn't say what your hands do hold. He doesn't say, um, he says what they can hold. And if you think about this kind of relationship where he's saying, he says, I enter Jiju Zammai and 
there's no there's no there's there's no pushing anything around. There is only in my heart the hope that whatever you can hold, you will trust it, you'll treasure it. And in that there's a possibility for practice that um, you can hold the teaching that arrives through you because you're not separate from the Buddha uh, in the first place. Now, we ended last time. I said, but I say something like this, and then what happens is you stand over here with your big observer eye, and you look at this, and you go, oh, yes, very nice. I like thinking about practice that way. It seems a little less intense than this other one. No self-destructive uh, activity is necessary. And right, I can just kind of go to sleep. Potato head zen is the way that we're ref ref uh, uh, affectionately referred to by many of the Yinzai folks, right? And you say, oh, of course, I'm good in nature. It's like, you know, go to sleep. Or I'm just in this kind of removed position. If we want to understand this, we have to realize we're not over here. We're like here, we're here, we're here, we're here, we're here, we're here. We're like right in the thick of it. Um, and that's what practice is. This is not something which can just be kind of like drawn out in such an elegant diagram as it may be. And then, the, and then the issue's over. It's that we're right in the thick of the challenge of what it means to have the heart of awakening, to have the mind of awakening, which we all are, that our consciousness is that mind of awakening. And it's a great challenge to be, to be such a being. And so the inspiration for our practice, in some ways, I would think would be much more, there's like a fire. There's like a raging fire under us here. Here you can kind of say, well, I'll get to the fire, or how much fire will I apply, or am I willing to apply to get to here? But in this kind of situation, it's like, you know, you're just right on top of it. That's at least my um, experience of it and my, um, uh, what do you call it? my uh, uh, encouragement to you to feel that. Um, um, so then the question comes, Okay, so how to practice? You know, we can have this kind of explanation or we can have this kind of understanding of a different way of, of thinking about um, um, this illumination of Verachana Buddha, which is at the base of uh, everything. Um, what does it mean to receive and employ this self-illumination? That's what Jiju Zanma is about. And so, um, and so Menzon starts into that on page 10, um, where he starts talking about the true Zazen that has been transmitted by the Buddhas and ancestors. And you hear this term a lot in, um, in uh, Soto Zen teachings, the true Zazen or the true transmission. If you remember, he talked about this as the great functioning or the essential function. Again, that's referring back to the the awakening of um, of the uh, oh there it is let me look at my notes real quick and see if I want to go on this diversion I think I will not <laughs> um, so he he does he does. Oh gosh, I can't keep. I'm going to go on. Yeah, hopefully we'll get to the end. So there's this line that many of you will be familiar with. Um, when we hear something like "True Zazen that has been transmitted by the Buddhas and ancestors into the Tathagatas and Jiju Zanmai," we almost automatically snap back into this thinking of self and other. There are Buddhas and ancestors, and then there's me. And so what we we think the handed down means there's these elite people in which those are the people who um, the 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 uh, transmission hold. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about the transmission of the practice. There's one side of that which is totally true. There are not very many lineage holders, and those lineage holders are very important and in special people within a tradition to um, make this thing uh, all work. They don't make it work by themselves, okay? And that when we hear that transmission only in terms of that that's kind of elite viewpoint of it, we miss something that's really deeper. And in this line that many of you are familiar with, um, that goes, um, the mind of the great sage of India is intimately transmitted from west to east. 
there's something in that line which is really um, fantastic. We translate it because English is so so many articles and relational things that are coded into the context that aren't there in the Chinese. There's a lot of interpretation to say the mind of the great sage of India is intimately transmitted from west to east. Literally, that second line says east, west, intimately, mutually handed. Okay, that's what that's what what it says in the Chinese. So you could think of it as being the heart of the great sage of India. So this is the Buddha. Okay, so the heart of the Buddha, the wondrous heart of Nirvana, or the wondrous mind of Nirvana. That's what we're talking about in this line. What is its nature? It's not just that it's given from special person to special person to special person. It's that it's intimate, reciprocal handing between east and west. It's not just that it goes from the east to the west or the west from the east, but here and there, there and here are constantly in a reciprocal giving. That's the heart of the Buddha, is a recognition that these kinds of dichotomies are always in a reciprocal exchange. Now, why is that important? Because when we talk about the true Zazen that has been transmitted by the Buddhas and ancestors, that transmission is not just something which we can historically trace. It is a way to talk about that mind that of awakening. The Buddha's mind of awakening has east and west, and yet the total mutual um, reciprocal passing between and of East and West mean that the Buddha doesn't separate East and West. There can be an East and West without that being a problem. There can be a you and me without that being a problem. Like, I can be whole, and you can be whole, and we can be whole. We don't have to look for our wholeness in that kind of like squishing together or claiming I'm whole or claiming that you're that you're whole. Okay, so I know that could be feel a little esoteric, and um, you're welcome. <laughs> um, but that that kind of way of reading the text, I think, is important. Right? That we don't just take the kind of face the kind of face value of oh, this means it's been transmitted. I know it's been transformed, therefore I would trust it. The way to trust that transmitted thing is to explore what transmission means. And in this case, the word that's translated as transmission means uh, reciprocally handed back and forth. What's that in your heart where everything is reciprocally handed back and forth all, all of the time? That word reciprocal is kind of cool. It's made of two parts of the character. One part's tree and one part's eye. So the, the origin of the character, I, I'm, I'm into this stuff, so I looked it up and they're like, oh, probably comes from someone looking at a tree. And they were like, you know what? When you look at a tree, do you know what you think? There's a tree. And you know what you forget? I'm looking at it, right? You just think, oh, there's a tree. It's very, it's very quick. You just, you, your mind externalizes the tree and you totally forget about your participation in the treeness. But you're completely participating in the phenomena of the tree. Right? There's no tree, there's no, there's no tree independent of you seeing it. And I'm not talking here about some metaphysical explanation. I'm just saying the phenomena of the tree, your, the, the appearance of a tree takes both you looking at it and the tree. There's a mutuality that's involved in that. So that's how intimate the mutuality is. It's not, it's not just between people or something like that. It's right at the root of our consciousness. Um, okay, enough of that. That was the diversion. So uh, then he makes this claim on 11 and 12 that the six paramitas and all of the 84,000 Dharma gates are without exception included in this Jiji Uzamahai because of this, because it's not just meditation practice. If it was meditation practice, it's one of the six perfections. The perfection of concentration. So that's the, f the fifth pers uh, perfection. That's one of the kind of schemas of, of how to lay out practice. He says it's not that. It's not the perfection of concentration, right? But the perfection of concentration is completely included in Jiju Zanmai, as well as the other six um, paramitas of giving and ethics and um, zeal and patience and wisdom. Right? They're all included. When you sit in the samadhi, you will enter directly into the realm of the Tathagata. So, 
I love all that stuff, but it also feels a little bit like the cheerleading squad, right? It's like, so you kind of get, I get kind of left with, I mean, I dig it. I'm like, I like being, you know, encouraged like that. But then I kind of think like, well, what am I supposed to do? Which is kind of an interesting question. Maybe that's the problem in the first place is that's the question that I ask. Um, but um, because Menzon is kind, he says, don't worry. This is on page 12 at the bottom. He says, I will explain the way to clarify and rely on the Samadhi. Whether he actually explains that or not, I would leave up to you to decide. <laughs> but he at least says that what's what he's going to do. And then he enters this section where he's explaining what the true Zazen practice is. Now, I have a tendency to just read the next couple pages and say that's his explanation of it. But I'd like to encourage you, actually, the whole rest of the text is. So he's going to write up front. We're going to talk about it now. He's going to really give a strong explanation of what his understanding of, of meditation is. And you might think that's his explanation of it, but then he's going to go into an uh, explanation of the deluded mind. And that explanation of the deluded mind is equally part of his explanation about how to clarify and rely on the samadhi, as is the upfront instruction that he's giving about, um, about how to um, uh, uh, practice Zazen. So if you've got a text with you, just look at page 12, just so you know where it is. I'll read it all. He says this thing. I love it when teachers say this. He says, okay, so how do you clarify and rely this somebody? He says, it's simply done by. <laughs> You're like, okay, great. <laughs> simply done by. This is like when you meet the Tai Chi master and they're just like, oh yeah, you just simply go who, you know, and you know there's no way that you're going to do it and you're going to be like this, you know. Um, but it really is uh, a teaching. It's like actually, it's not about getting a whole bunch more power to be able to do it. It's like you have to find the living body of it the living body of Zazen, not the kind of like, I have become good enough or strong enough or whatever enough to be able to do it. I've discovered something. I've discovered there's something alive here. That's where your proficiency comes from. So in that way, I like, I like it when he says simply done by. It's kind of a reminder of that. He says simply done by not clouding the light of yourself. When the light of the self is clear, you follow neither dullness nor distraction. Kind of instruction, not clouding the light of yourself. There's actually something that Okumura Roshi left out in the translation. I'm not quite sure why. After the not clouding the light of yourself, the text says, release the outside or let go of, that would be another way to say, it, let go of outside things. So he's referring to the self. He says, the light of yourself, not clouding the light of yourself and letting go of the outside. So when I read that, I'm still left with the question, okay, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> and then he comes into that um, a little bit more um, in the next paragraph. And I would say, if there's a paragraph that you come back and read again and again to try to clarify um, Menzon's teaching here um, is on page 13, really the, the paragraph that starts on the page of bottom, bottom of page 12, which I've been reading. But really this paragraph, on, uh, it continues on to 13. That, that whole section there is, um, is uh, really, I think, core to understanding Menzon's teaching here. So I'll just read it to you. Um, you can follow along if you have a text. The third patriarch said, or I prefer to say the third ancestor said, when the cloudless light illuminates itself, there is no need to make mental struggle. There is no waste of energy. This is the vital point of the practice and enlightenment of the samadhi. The cloudless light illuminates itself means the light of the self shines brightly. Not to make mental struggle means not to add the illusory mind's discrimination to the reality. When you make mental struggle, the light becomes illusory mind and brightness becomes darkness. In this case, brightness is referring to wisdom, darkness is referring to ignorance. Mm -hmm. If you do not make mental struggle, the darkness itself becomes the self-illumination of the light. This is similar to the light of a jewel illuminating the jewel itself. 
For example, it is like the light of the sun or the moon illuminating everything, mountains and rivers, human beings and dogs, etc., equally without differentiation or evaluation. Also, a mirror reflects everything without bothering to discriminate. In this Jiji Uzammai, just keep the light of the self in clouded, unclouded without being concerned with discrimination of objects. This is the meaning of Wan Shi Zenji's expression in his Azanji. And he quotes, quotes that. So this paragraph right here, particularly this line, if you do not make mental struggle, the darkness itself will become the self-illumination of the light. Now, many of you know this um, line. We use a different translation. Um, it comes from, like he says here, the third ancestor. That's, a, that's part of the... Um, Verses of Faith Mind, which we chant here in the morning on um, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and we've had some classes on that and some practice periods on it. So you may um, you may recognize this if I say bright and empty, functioning naturally, the mind does not exert itself. Okay, so that's a translation that we normally uh, use. Okumura Roshi has uh, taken a kind of poetic um, approach to the, those same words, and I quite like it. He says, the cloudless light illuminates itself. There's no need to make mental struggle. No waste of energy. to do. It's starting to get more challenging, right? We're getting a little cornered. That maybe our doing and our solving and our manipulating and our transforming and all the kind of things that we want to apply here, Menzon's pretty consistent. He's saying that's when you do that, you're recreating the karma of rejecting and grasping that there's another possibility in which there's some type of acceptance which you can both receive and employ um, in this case when you sit down but also when you're doing anything you know, it's not restricted to the posture of, of what we typically call Zazen that this heart or mind of Nirvana that the Buddha um, uh, referred to um, is also the mind that he uh, uh, discovered under the Bodhi tree when he said, um, I, the great earth, and all beings together at the same time attain to the way. So his, his explanation was all inclusive. He didn't say, I have attained to the way, now you guys do your best. Right? He said that we're all included in that. What's the mind which can reflect delusion and awakening equally? It's not dividing everything out. Um, this, is, this is the kind of thing that Menzon is pointing us to, um, that that's what our practice is about, the inquiry into that mind, um, not simply trying to force ourselves into it, because we can't. There's no outside. There's no other. So you can't get in. And that's a big conundrum. Now, I want to play with that a little bit. You guys are going to love this. Check this out. Are you excited? <laughs> oh. Bam! There's even a big jewel at the bottom. So I wrote this down before we had a dinner. Um, so. This is the shape of my mind. <laughs> so I'm just sharing with you. Let me see if I can explain it a little bit. Menzon, and I think I've been following along with him to set up this kind of, um, uh, to show a kind of dichotomy for the purposes of clarifying something, clarifying how, how our deluded mind works uh, about practice. And so, again, this is the same picture that I've been drawing. I think my mood is a little bit nicer here. Um, the practice of cutting off delusion and opening enlightenment. This is a standard phrase within Zen, okay? To cut off 
delusion and open enlightenment. Incidentally, my teacher, what he would talk a lot about this, he would say, don't cut off delusion and open enlightenment. He'd say, uh, he'd say uh, cut off, if you cut off delusion, you open delusion. If you cut off enlightenment, you open enlightenment. That was, he, he was really uh, into that. This is what's referred to as two vehicles and like I had, um, I had uh, uh, mentioned before. Um, this one, <coughs> what your hands can hold, this is also referred to as, you'll notice in Enzon Tazas, he calls it Tathagata Zen, or Ancestral Zen. Right? So it's the Zen that's re relying on the function, the essential function of the ancestors, right? which is received from the Tathagata. The Tathagata is another name for the Buddha, the Thus Come One. These can go by another name, these, these two kind of approaches. And those are the gradual, and the sudden. And this becomes really important um, kind of debate or dichotomy within the Zen tradition, which is important for us to, uh, to study. And the most um, common way that it's referred to is the, um, the competition for the succession of the fifth ancestor in China. Like, so who became the sixth ancestor? So the fifth ancestor was going to retire and um, said to the community, with lots and lots of monks, um, here's a wall in the monastery, write your poem of understanding on the wall. And so it's said that the monk who was to become, was everyone expected to become the sixth ancestor, wrote this uh, first poem. The body is the Bodhi tree, the mind, a clear mirror stand. In this case, mirror stand doesn't mean just the stand, it means like a what do you call that? Like, and you're in a room, and there's a mirror that's on a stand. Mirror. That's the only thing I could come up with as mirror stand. This is my translation, by the way. Like, it's not just a mirror, but it's referring to the, like, the wooden parts and all that that make it that make it be there. So, the mind, a clear mirror stand. Time and again, wipe it diligently. Don't let it gather dust. And then it said that the the um, uh, person who became the sixth ancestor. Hui Neng, or we, we call Daikon Eno. Um, he was a illiterate, um, kind of sub monk. He was sort of a provisional ordination that let him work in the kitchen. And um, he said to someone, Oh, read it, tell me what that says. And, um, and they read it, and he said, Oh, that's bullocks. Um, and uh, he said, Write this instead. And so he got someone else to write this on it. The Enlightenment is not originally a tree, the bright mirror has no stand. In truth, there is not a single thing. Where can dust fall? And he took the day, um, and he became the sixth ancestor. At least if you're in his lineage, he became the sixth ancestor. Um, and uh, the, the other teacher, whose name is escaping me right now, um, also uh, became an eminent teacher and had his own uh, lineage, which survived for several generations and is no longer um, extent. This exchange gets referred to a lot um, in, um, in Zen circles to talk about this relationship between um, the gradual and the sudden. So the gradual being, okay, maybe in a provisional Mahayana teaching, I even admit everyone has Buddha nature. Everyone is essentially this mirror that just reflects everything. But in the gradual approach, the idea is we have to get rid of the dust. We have to keep the dust away. And so you're always wiping it, wiping it, wiping it, wiping it, wiping it. And that activity of wiping it is going to allow you to reveal what the true what the true thing is, and that's going to take a long time. Right? So this is kind of a way of thinking. I'm not saying that's the only interpretation of it. But I'm saying that's often that's how it's presented. When it comes to the sudden enlightenment, you can tell the difference of the tone. He's like, "What do you mean tree? And what do you mean the mirror has a stand? There's no edge to the mirror. There's no there's no like you can't put it on a shelf. You can't locate it someplace. Yeah, there's a mirror, but it's completely it's boundless. That mirror which is, is kind of symbol for heart, awakened heart, the illuminated mind. He said, but there's no, there's no place that you can define its position. Um, in truth, there's nothing. Maybe parenthesis, except mirror, and parenthesis. Mm -hmm. Where can dust fall? What is not mirror that could fall on the mirror? What is outside of the mirror, which could fall on the mirror and we could call dust? This is the kind of thing that he's saying. There's nothing out, there's nothing separate. There's nothing separate from the mirror. 
It's all total reflection. And because of that, we can't, um, we, we can't really talk about dust. So, I think this is a way better poem than that poem. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. If I was the fifth ancestor, I super would have like called Hui Neng into my office in the middle of the night and give him the robe and the bowl and say, you better run away because they're going to kill you. Because uh, they didn't expect that you were the one who was going <laughs> to get this, which is in fact what happened. And then he went into hiding and then later on um, you know, got called back by the emperor to teach everybody and became a famous monk and all. You know, it's all like you know, a, a superhero movie kind of. <laughs> kind of quality to it, which I love. Um, at the same time, I think that we oftentimes misunderstand that. And the, ringing, the reason I'm bringing this up is not to just um, say, see, here's another example of why this pattern of thinking about it is better than that pattern of thinking about it. My understanding of this is that um, both of these are talking about this mirror they're talking about the other a phrasing we've been using, the Menzon's been using is the, is the jewel, which illuminates itself. He even says that in this passage, right? It's like a jewel that illuminates itself. Um, and what this poem is talking about is what it means to wipe. Usually when we think of wiping, we think there's dust on the mirror. Let me go get the rag and wipe it clean. But my understanding of what the sixth ancestor ancestor is doing is telling us what it means to wipe. How? What should I do to um, uh, to confront this dust? Because I got to tell you, you could say all day long, "Oh, there's no dust," but there's dust, right? <laughs> I mean, there isn't dust, but there is. That's both true. So the dust is like the wreck of our lives. The way that we like like march around and do um, unskillful things constantly and cause lots and lots of suffering, right? There's no denying the the pain of our deluded um, way of being, um, and so when we just rely on this one and we don't see that side, there's a way in which we can just undercut the necessity. Again, we can say, "Oh, everything's perfect because I'm receiving the body of the Buddha," and you can kind of um, become rigid in this allegiance to an idea that there's no problem or that there's no dust. I think actually to wipe the mirror, right, what uh, Menzon's gonna talk about, he's gonna talk about the melting of the delusive mind. Right here we're talking about wiping the mirror. Menzon's gonna say the melting of the delusive mind. It's in the, like the paragraph after that. Um, this is a kind of uh, instruction about melting the delusive mind or being present for the melting of the delusive mind. So at the end of page uh, 13, um, he says, when you practice and learn the reality of Zazen thoroughly, the frozen blockage of illusory mind will naturally melt away. If you think that you have cut off illusory mind instead of simply clarifying how illusory mind melts, illusory mind will come up again. And then he says, it's like, you know, dandelions. Well, I don't think he said dandelions. I think he says weeds or something. If you just cut them off from the top, they grow back. Right? So, to see the difference here, he's saying, um, if you want to just leave behind delusion to get to awakening, this illumination, the, the all-pervasive reflection of this mirror is broken and you just keep churning the same chasing after and leaving behind that you all that you always do uh-huh. can you re- reread that little passage yeah 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 i will thanks um uh let me finish that thought and then i'll read this one if you keep if you keep doing that that's where you that's that's all you end up doing you have to not reject the illusory mind not because the illusory mind is re- is like the thing you should trust it's not because it's good. It's not about it being good. It's because it's whole. Illusory mind, samsara, all the suffering is not separate from the Buddha's awakening. The Buddha didn't shirk responsibility for all the suffering of all these beings that he awakened with at all. He stayed right there and said, yeah, we're all doing it together. He didn't like take off. He was like, yeah, I know you're deluded. And here I am, right? We're all, we're all right here in this undividable heart. 
when you practice and learn the reality of Zazen thoroughly, the frozen blockage of illusory mind will naturally melt away. If you think that you have cut off illusory mind, instead of simply clarifying how illusory mind melts, illusory mind will come up again. So don't try to cut it off. Illuminate it. Know its illumination. The darkness itself becomes the self-illumination of the light. If you do not make mental struggle, the darkness, the illusion, the delusion, if you don't struggle with it, itself will become the self-illumination of the light. This is his, this is his point. Okay? Now, in a way, this can all just sound very idealistic, and I'm aware of that, but it's important to understand the framing that he's coming at. And what I really appreciate about Menzon is now he's going to dive into the illusory mind. He doesn't just leave you there and say like, well, you know, you know what illusion is, right? So just like watch that melt away. Um, he's like, well, check out. Let's talk about delusion. You know, this is really interesting. If you read the Buddha's the, you know, teachings of the Buddha, particularly the Pali Canon, um, the teachings of the Buddha, there is like page after page after page after page about how screwed up we are. And you kind of think like, I remember um, one of my early mentors um, uh, who's just so instrumental in um, setting me on the path, uh, Professor Woodruff, Kenneth Woodruff is his name, is an Englishman who lived in Tokyo for many decades and I had the good fortune of meeting him when I was 15 and he was really kind of took a shine to me. He was in his 80s and he would take me for dinner and he put books in my hand like the Tao Te Ching and he was one of these people who, when you meet them, who it's like there's like a flashlight inside their eyes when they look at you, it's like they're like light coming out of their eyes, these bright blue eyes. He was this little guy. He always had a cane. Anyway, he was so great. Um, but he was like, I don't like Buddhism. It's too negative. And I think a lot of the reasons it gets that rap is because we spend a lot of time learning about delusory mind. We, we, really, we really want to understand it, but not because we want it to rule our life or we're saying, well, that's our lot. There's nothing we can do about it. It's exactly the opposite. We want to know about it because the melting of that illusory mind is the intimacy with it. When we push it away, we can't, we can't do anything with it. It just becomes the other. Right? And, um, and that's, not, you know, that's not what the Buddha did, it's just like in a very practical sense. He hung out with all these hooligans. I mean, like real troublemakers. Right? And they'll join the Sangha. And he's like, okay, I better make some more rules. Because <laughs> not that people are going to keep them, <laughs> but you know, we should at least have them. It, I mean, I think it was quite a zoo. What was the thing you told us today? That phrase you told us? A goat rodeo. Goat rodeo. A goat rodeo. <laughs> yeah, a goat rodeo. And, um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, there's a side of it which is like very, like, a, like a, these teachings which are very, um, sometimes very slippery and hard to follow, but sometimes inspiring and, and all those kind of things. And, and I want you to study all that, and Menzon's all about that. So as you're studying this, you, you, know, you build a faculty with that. But I also really want to encourage you, like, it's a goat rodeo. And that's not a problem. That's actually the opportunity for our lives. And the more we try to be like, I'm a Zen student, I don't get angry or I don't like whatever you know, name the thing that you you know are convinced that you're beyond um, it's just like okay just whack the thing in half you know you're, you're going after one side and you're just creating the same thing um, when you can um, spend some time in the intimacy of of heart which has no outside if you pay attention to it there's no there's no outside you can't find your way out of it. No? And that sometimes that feels like a trap, like I'm just I'm trapped in me. But in the, in the quietness, in the maybe darkness of the morning, in the fresh air of the autumn, there is um, a presence in which you, you, you can't find something else. In that place that you know that, like, uh, It's no struggle will take you beyond your problems. Um, there's, uh, um, there's some deeper um, acceptance that is available, um, but it doesn't, it's it like, you can't work your way into it. 
and you can't um, you can't uh, 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 you can't wait for it to show up. You got to actually put yourself on the line and and um, encounter those uh, those blockages to be able to um, study how it is that they move and um, now. So that's my story. I'm planning on sticking to it. Um, but I am not beyond um, rebuttals and or questions. So just <coughs> I, uh, you talked a little bit about the beginning where he talks about various kinds of meditation. Yeah. And one of them is uh, searching for the subject. Yeah. And having that been a practice in my past, mm -hmm. there's ways that I feel like I've fallen into seeing the edgeless mirror mm -hmm. through that practice. Mm -hmm. But you seem to be saying something different just now mm -hmm. about being present with that mirror yeah, yeah. through our life yeah. mm -hmm. without that searching. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Yeah, so when you can see the edges of the mirror, um, then it's become an object. Yeah. It's on a stand. Yeah. And so that's not, you know, that's natural, um, but diluted. Um, and so um, there, uh, you know, uh, on a basic level, I say just don't invest in it. Right. Don't don't see that and go, oh, I can see the edges of the mirror. Right. Just say, oh, edges of the mirror. I guess in in my experience, it's it's not so much that. I find the edges of the mirror. Mm. It's that I find that I can't find the edges of the mirror. Uh, and in, in that not finding, all of a sudden, yeah. it opens. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, because you're asking the question, you're looking for You're looking for the subject, uh -huh. and then the not finding of it, yeah, yeah, all yeah. of a sudden, yeah. it just, it all opens up. Yeah, yeah. So this is where, this is the, um, um, I think this is why he criticizes this practice, yeah. because it, it has a rush. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that the rush is, Bad, and if any of you want to experience that, like question, go for it. Um, I would. Uh, I'm not. I'm not saying it's evil, or I don't think Menzon's saying it's evil. He's just saying we get sidetracked by it, mm -hmm. and then that rush, which can be really, in, it can be informative in a way. When I was a kid, um, I uh, I discovered this thing that if I look in the mirror, and I look really, you, you could try this too if you want. Look in the mirror and just stare at yourself for a while until it gets weird. <laughs> which doesn't take that long, okay? And then you're you're there, you just you're staring, and it gets kind of weird. And then and then say to yourself, I am not me. I am me. I would say it like this: I'm me, but I'm not me. If I'm not me, then what am I? And I would say that, and then this like uh, it was like this energy would come up from the ground through my toes and like up to my head, and then back down, and then come up, and then my head would go like, which when you're like twelve is pretty sweet. You don't have to smoke any dope or anything. It was just like, and so I got kind of like into that, and I would and I would do it, and then I got to the place where I didn't have to look in a mirror to do it. Um, why am I telling this story? <laughs> oh, it was cool. It was, it was cool. And, and you might have experiences like that. I mean, I'm kind of given to that kind of experience, yeah. um, for better or for worse. It probably led me into more Zen practice, but I would say it also is a big red herring. Um, a lot of times they kind of follow that sort of experience. So, um, so there may be certain like processes that you can go through which bring about certain insights and or certain kinds of experiences. But as we harness them in this type of a fashion, they become a kind of lever. And when they become a lever, we'll replicate the karmic hindrances through the lever. We'll take whatever our karmic hindrances are and we'll, rep, we'll, we'll use them as the crowbar to try to crowbar ourselves over into awakening in some way. And that's kind of where the problem happens. So um, it, 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 it's a, uh, I think if we've had those kinds of experiences, um, to appreciate them and even really appreciate what they've taught us and be able to become intimate with the quality of what that is, but then um, to really be careful about how it becomes a dodge on like, oh wow, I kind of feel like crap today, or I'm feeling, I'm, I'm, um, um, 
uh, I have this mysterious kind of nervous energy. I don't know what it is. Or I was super mean to my wife last night and I super regret it. And I can hardly stay on the cushion because I didn't, I haven't apologized to her yet. This has not happened <laughs> today. <laughs> many times. That's not the present thing. That just came out of my head. So, um, so whatever what we're trying to dodge, that crowbar becomes you know immediately present for that, and that's kind of where the where the, mm -hmm. uh, the issue is. But I take I'd say uh, generally speaking a more kind of globalist feeling about different kinds of practice than Menzon does, at least in this text. I think actually, and probably he had to have all of those experiences to be able to write this text. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of think that we take too narrow of a view, it's not so helpful that actually having a broad kind of experience is good. It's just when push comes to shove, are we trying to beat ourselves into shape or are we recognizing the jewel that's really present in this deeper way that we keep dodging because it's challenging that jewel is challenging it's a jewel it's the most precious thing but it's not going to play by your rules you know the ones that are a kind of a tidy well-kept um spiritual plan yeah, <laughs> yeah. hi um i may be investing too much in the poetics or the, the, the metaphor, but for a long time, um, I struggled with the language melt away, mm -hmm. melting yeah. as a um, as a, a set of words. Yeah. And it, it, you know, in part, there's a sense that how can this illusory mind melt mm -hmm. and go somewhere else mm -hmm. or, or be um, uh, move from one state to another mm -hmm. in that kind of physical, like physics sort of way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is the Chinese or is the language, um, is, that a tra is that a translation from a, 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 a is that like a translation of, of a different idea, or can you explain it? So I went and looked that up. I'm glad I did because you asked the question. Otherwise, I would be like I have to make something up. For it. <laughs> um, so it's interesting here. He doesn't use a Chinese character. He uses the uh, the Japanese words. Um, um, uh, tokeru, which means to melt, um, but doesn't use the Chinese character, uses the phonetics for it. But it's not, you know, the, the, the translation here says melt away. I would prefer not to have the away in the sentence if I was translating it. I would say the image there is, you know, and always an image has its own limitations, you know, like like uh, later on, he's going to go into that extensively about mirrors. He's going to say it's like a mirror, and then he's going to say, he's going to say like, you know, but every metaphor has its limitations. So if you think of the mirror this way, that's not the point. Um, and and uh, and I really appreciate that he points that out because it's easy to go off on the on the metaphor. So here, the metaphor is that there's something that's stuck, and that's the ice, and that's the that's the kind of delusion. But that when it melts, it's still water. The ice is water, the water's water, but you get to see there's a freedom that wasn't there um, um, in the in the ice. Um, that's the kind of image that he's that he's giving. I mean, in some way, you know, he is he's still you know pitching a little bit to this uh, kind of um, possibility or this process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there a relationship between this and dropping body and mind? This melting. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think we could say that's this is another way to describe it. Yeah, and he and he does use that. He when he talks about neha myoshin, um, like the wondrous mind of Nirvana or the samadhi, uh, the king of samadhis or whatever. Another thing that he uses in the text is dropping off body and mind. He says all that list, and he says this is what Dogen Zenji called dropping off body and mind. The body and mind dropped off, and so. Um, and so I love that Dogen just brings it down like to this very kind of immediate um, thing. Although I guess for me the um, wondrous mind of Nirvana feels kind of immediate too. But yeah. Okay. So next time um, tonight we've been talking about true zazen, um, and if you look for those of you who have a text again, sorry for that we didn't have enough tonight for everyone on page fourteen. Um, in the middle of the page there, there's the paragraph that starts, Mumyo, fundamental delusion, is called illusory mind. That section, um, from basically from page 14 to page 17, um, uh, he talks about um, like 14, 15, and 16. Um, 
uh, he talks about illusory mind. And then in, he talks about Buddha wisdom. So illusory mind and Buddha wisdom are a pair, right? Like the illusion, the, the delusion and awakening. And so he's going to talk about the same thing from two sides. So 14 to 17 is illusory mind and 17 to 19 is Buddha wisdom. So we'll talk about those two um, uh, next week. We'll see how far um, we get on that. And, um, and then I think in terms of timing, we have next week, the week after that, and then there's one week that we go into meditation retreat. So that Thursday, there won't be class. There's meditation. You're welcome to come for that, but there won't be class. And then we'll pick up after that and do the, uh, the final, um, however many, four classes. Good. Thank you for being here. Thank you.